Given that you can run your Spark notebooks in your Fabric workspaces for data engineering and data science, how does that compare with running those in Databricks instead? That's something I found myself wondering as I've been exploring Fabric more and more in the last couple of weeks. And in this video, I'm going to share some of my thoughts about this uh, so far. Many data lakes and lakehouse architectures are built today using Databricks as a general purpose data and analytics processing engine, uh, while the data itself is stored in a separate service like Azure Data Lake or Amazon S3. Now, Microsoft Fabric offers something similar uh, because whenever we create new Fabric items like data warehouses and lakehouses in the portal, the data is stored in uh, one lake, uh, the new offering that Microsoft is now called calling uh, the OneDrive for data. And then we can query this data in Fabric using Power Query or Notebooks, TC Cool or Spark. OneLake supports all these different compute engines. And actually OneLake is also just using Azure Data Lake under the hood. So it's really just another layer of abstraction that acts as a storage location for all your data in Fabric. Every Fabric tenant has exactly one OneLake associated with it. Uh, so you can really think of it as one big Azure Data Lake storage account for your entire organization. So how do Fabric and Databricks relate to each other? As I said, one lake where all your Fabric data gets stored is built on Azure Data Lake and it uses the same APIs and it also uses the same Delta Parquet file format for storing the data. So you can actually connect your Databricks and your Databricks notebooks directly to your one lake endpoints, uh, exactly the same as you would with your Azure Data Lake endpoint. Now the the question still is why would we run our notebooks in Databricks or connect Databricks to one leg when we can just run those notebooks in Fabric instead? There's a couple of factors here that determine which service is better for your situation and I'm going to talk about what I think are the most important factors right now and those are cost as well as some additional Databricks features like workflows and also version control. In Databricks, billing consists mainly of the cost of virtual machines that you use to run your clusters and then on top of that there's a charge for what are called data Databricks units, uh, which is just an additional fee on top of the virtual machines themselves for the additional processing capabilities that Databricks offers. Uh, so how much you pay depends on the number of virtual machines that you use for your clusters, the type of those virtual machines, because you have different types optimized for different types of workloads, and then finally how many minutes a month do you run those virtual machines. On Azure there's also an option to pre-purchase Databricks computes up to a one year or three years in advance, in which case you can get very significant discounts up to 35% or so compared to just paying as you go. Fabric pricing on the other hand is more simple in some ways and very similar to the Power BI capacity tiers. As you move up the tiers you get an increasing number of capacity units which determine how much compute do you have for processing your Fabric workloads. And these workloads include not only your notebooks but also your data pipelines, your data flows, your Power BI reports being loaded to your users, all these different things you can do on Fabric. And while this is simpler, it also makes it impossible to directly compare the cost between the two services because there's really no way of knowing uh, how much performance you get out of a certain number of capacity units on Fabric compared to a similar cost virtual machine capacity uh, in Databricks. So the only real way to compare the two would be to run some test workloads on both services and seeing how they perform and how much you pay. I think I'll try and make a video like that in the near future. But for now, that's really all I can say about the cost between the two services. Pricing models are quite different, but if you find yourself in a situation where you need to compare the two uh, for your organization, deciding which one you should use, understanding the two pricing models at this high level is a very good starting point. Now regarding these additional features that you get in Databricks, but not in Fabric. First of all, in Databricks, you have the ability to orchestrate workflows where you can also set the dependencies between in the notebooks that you want to run, run them in a particular order, and it's also very easy to diagnose failures in your workflows and failures in your notebooks. And while you can create something similar in Fabric using pipelines, it's not quite the same because the pipeline UI simply isn't designed with just notebooks in mind. So I'm personally a big fan of the Databricks workflows, especially if you're only running notebooks instead of these other activities that you can then also include uh, in Fabric pipelines. And secondly, we have version control, and this is a big one. As it is now, Fabric doesn't allow you to integrate your notebooks with version control like GitHub, while Databricks does. 
And while this is definitely something that Fabric will have in the future, I have no doubt about it, we will have to see how long it's gonna take until that becomes reality. So in the meanwhile, I think this difference alone is a deal breaker for any organization that has more than one person working on notebooks. At that point, you really do want some kind of version control. And if the service you are using doesn't support that, uh, it's really a non-starter in my opinion. So that's it for this first comparison between Fabric and Databricks. If there's any conclusion I can make at this point, it's that Fabric is definitely not going to replace Databricks anytime soon. And it's very seamless to use the two together, uh, thanks to the one leg architecture in Fabric that you can easily link up to Databricks. As always, I hope you've gotten some value out of this video. If so, do consider leaving me some feedback in the comments or subscribing to the channel. It really helps a lot as I continue creating content like this for data engineers. And I'll see you in the next video.